Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. The bullish pennant pattern continues, guys, for XRP. XRP right now trading at 45.7, and um, you guys can see I drew this yesterday, and uh, the trend staying within the pennant region here, uh, not really breaking down to suggest uh, any new lower lows, and conversely, we're not actually seeing XRP uh, break up to the upside either. So just kind of staying within this pattern here. Positive news though, because you know, staying within the confines of the bullish pennant pattern does usually suggest that we are going to continue making our way up. Of course, this is going to be largely dependent on Bitcoin and um, just taking a look at Bitcoin here real quickly. Bitcoin trading right now at $19,400 per BTC. We've just seen sideways trading, low volume sideways trading, not a lot of price movement. Uh, for Bitcoin here, but I have a feeling we will see something very, very soon. Some kind of an event that is going to get price moving yet again, as you guys can see here, Bitcoin forming that double bottom pattern uh, that we've seen over the last uh, several months now. This is Bitcoin on the daily, throwing that on the weekly. Uh, it would be defined a little more prominently here. Bitcoin on the weekly, you guys can see there, boom, the down movement, that rally upward, Another retrace back to find support here. And hopefully another move to the upside. This will get the market rolling. Right now, though, nothing really to write home about. Jeremy Hogan, though, finally dropped a video yesterday. I know we were all uh, really excited to get his uh, point of view on the uh, most recent news that we got with the Ripple SEC lawsuit. I know a lot of you guys probably caught this video. Wow, 100,000 views in just one day. Congratulations, Jeremy. Obviously, a lot of XRP hodlers want to get the skivvy on uh, what is going on with the lawsuit. I mean, it's apparent just from the view count alone. And Bill here giving his two cents, um, something that Jeremy actually didn't cover in this video. I have now had a chance to properly consider the SEC's reply to Ripple's arguments on the need for certain essential ingredients, including a contract, for there to be an investment contract. That's an interesting point. There actually was not an investment contract, like a physical contract that was signed, dated, uh, between any of the parties involved. The SEC goes to some lengths to mischaracterize Ripple's attempts to construe a non-defined statutory term, investment contract, by reference to uh, pre-1933 Blue Sky case law as its Ripple's own manufactured test. There's a lot of rhetoric using words such as extremist argument, radical proposition, far-fetched theories, reactionary argument. I find this language to be undergraduate and unnecessary and a sign of weakness in legal argumentation, but perhaps it is acceptable in the U.S. in making written legal arguments. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, I believe Bill is from Australia. There are only two points the SEC makes that I think are strong. Firstly, Ripple may have a weakness in confining the term scheme uh, the way it does. Ripple's argument is that transaction or scheme merely conveys that a court should look at the broader context in which the instrument is grounded. The SEC points out that Ripple cites no case and holds this to be the case. Secondly, the SEC points out that Section 5 of the Securities Act prohibits unregistered offerings, not just sales, and an offer until accepted and with consideration is not a contract at common law. And the argument that prohibition of offers would not have been included if Section 5 was only concerned with legally enforceable contracts has some force there. So as per Bill, um, those are the two kind of strongest arguments, I guess, uh, that he sees in the SEC's argument. Apart from those, though, a couple of points, I think that the SEC has not really raised a strong argument in response to Ripple on this issue. It would be in a better position if it was targeting specific Ripple sales or offers of XRP, which it does not and not running this absurdly broad case of targeting all XRP sales or offers for eight years, including in secondary markets. This is the thing with the SEC. They've really kind of shot themselves in the foot in, in ways because there are, I mean, quite frankly, there are all kinds of types of sales of XRP and have been over the last eight years. And it doesn't seem, and they're just kind of putting a blanket statement on these sales, not really defining any particular sales of XRP. And, um, you know, since we know, and since they probably know or should know that all these sales are different, I mean, maybe some are similar, but by and large, there are so many types of sales and so many different reasons why people would want to buy and sell XRP and they don't define it. And so, you know, that could be, and the fact too, that they don't even have a physical contract, those should be a couple of reasons at least to get XRP hodlers excited. Um, we also got Jeremy Hogan responding to Bill's uh, tweet thread here. He wrote this, I wanted to talk about this in the video, but really didn't have time. These are horrible facts for the SEC exactly because they waited eight years to bring the action. Uh, again, makes you question why this case was brought in the first place. 
So Jeremy Hogan just responding to uh, Bill's tweet thread there. If you guys haven't caught uh, Jeremy Hogan's video, I will link it in the description of the video, but I'm sure many of you have already caught this. And so XRP's last piece of the puzzle snapped into place. This brought to us by Michael Branch here, reported by you today. The other thing, it has been learned that statements from 3,000 XRP holders will be involved in the lawsuit between the crypto company Ripple and the SEC. The notarized testimonies referred to in law as affidavits were collected uh, directly by Ripple. The collection of XRP holders affidavits uh, was made possible thanks to the steps initiated by the pro XRP lawyer and activist John Deaton, who also represents this group in a class action lawsuit against the SEC. So Jeremy Hogan just pointing that out. The last pieces of the puzzle are us guys, the XRP hodlers, and uh, specifically those who uh, sign affidavits for uh, John Deaton's case, the, um, the amicus. Uh, exhibit 167 is broken into 26 parts. Although sealed, it has been filed as ECF 655-1-26. When you have a massive exhibit with hundreds of thousands of pages, John Deaton writes, the system can't handle all as one exhibit and must be broken up. Looks like 3,000 XRP holder affidavits were submitted by Ripple. So boom, Ripple submitted these affidavits. Bringing in the affidavits of XRP holders is the last piece of the puzzle. According to Jeremy Hogan, XRP holders are responding to the securities charge with two arguments at once. Firstly, the cryptocurrency was purchased for use as payment uh, or for other non-investment purposes. Uh, and on the other hand, those XRP holders who have confessed to investment purposes have said that they did not expect the return on their investment to come from Ripple, but from the exchange rate difference. So those who bought XRP for an investment said that, you know, it was going to be based on basically a spec market, the bid and ask price on the exchange. Um, you know, like we sell any kind of cryptocurrency in a spec market, buy XRP at 22 cents, sell it at $1.96. Well, you've made your profit um, just from the spec market and not from uh, Ripple specifically. So here we have it, new arguments to consider. Uh, so the outcome is near. The news of a direct involvement of holders is another positive development for Ripple and XRP in their legal battle against the SEC. Those that have occurred in recent weeks certainly include statements from Ripple's partners describing how they are using XRP. So that was the other thing, guys. We did get uh, another uh, few briefs that were filed, one uh, most recently by Spend the Bits, a company that utilizes the XRP ledger to um, be able to send, transact in all types of cryptocurrencies, most notably Bitcoin, which is famously slow for transaction purposes, kind of makes the whole concept of the Lightning Network unnecessary um, because we've got a better mousetrap, we've got a solution. Spend the Bits did file their amicus the other day. So some great developments here. Wanted to thank Michael Branch for posting that. Uh, and Wrath of Kahneman here has got a burning question, and uh, if you think about it, it's actually quite a good question. The burning question for the SEC versus Ripple trial, do the Hinman emails imperil every potential case the SEC could bring against crypto until the SEC issues clear guidance? Hmm, interesting. Think about it for a second. Hinman's emails, if once released, um, they could have an effect on every case, not just the Ripple SEC case, but every case moving forward. Curious to see how concerned they are about them becoming public. Uh, Kashta down here saying the emails mostly focus on their fair notice defense argument. Uh, if fair notice wins, some could claim uh, they too have no notice by law remaining unclear. Most were ICOs and had clear notice. Let's hope it doesn't come to fair notice. We want to win on merit. XRP isn't a security. Uh, and Wrath of Kahneman just saying, well said to that question. So other possibilities here floating around, and I got to thank uh, Wrath of Kahneman and Kashta uh, just for bringing up those points. It still isn't a done deal though, guys, but we are almost there as uh, Jeremy Hogan mentions uh, in this video. Another thing that I thought was interesting, Stefan Hubert brought this up. Okay, Mark Uate, okay, he just recently joined the SEC and apparently he said this recently, read through these quotes from SEC Commissioner Mark Uate's most recent speech. He describes how the SEC works on the edge of legality at best, which means that it sometimes crosses that line and how that SEC's current course is causing harm to the US that will last for decades. Here are a few quotes, guys, from the most recent appointee to the SEC commission. Since 2021, the commission's approach to promulgating new rules through processes that at best meet the bare minimum legal standards, a proposition that itself is open to question, can undermine the legitimacy of agency actions. And guys, another one here, uh, harm caused by unchecked government action is often based on a self-identified need for expediency, yet can take decades or more to cure. 
So he's saying these uh, could have long lasting effects on the SEC, their, uh, not just their reputation, but on the decisions they actually make. This could harm the economy. The government would do better to avoid taking actions that create such harm in the first place. And again, guys, this is from a guy who just recently got appointed as a new commissioner to the SEC. Stefan Hubert just posting the source if you guys want to read it directly from the horse's mouth. Uh, XRP Julian Williams here posting this. Is this a new commissioner? He seems to be rebelling against Gensler's methods. Could this be related to decisions to release uh, the, re sorry, the release of the emails? And has the balance within the commission changed? Very good questions. Crypto Chris down here saying, wait a minute. This is on the SEC website. Do they think this is a good thing? Or did they not really read it? <laughs> Much like the cases and evidence they bring to the table. Well, I mean, it's what Mark said. Mark Ueda. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I think it's Ueda. That's what he said. It's official on the record and it is on their website. So I uh, wanted to thank Stefan Hubert just for bringing that up. Um, and of course, John Deaton has been criticized as bringing upon conspiracy theories with regards to ETHgate. Yeah, the XRP community even created a hashtag for it. This one from Michael Branch. My man, Deaton challenges Coindesk to a debate if it thinks he supported one of these theories. And so John Deaton, willing to debate on this, uh, there have been allegations of corrupt practices involving the internal staff at the SEC and Ethereum officials during the formulation of William Hinman's 2018 speech. Several members of the cryptocurrency communities have weighed in on the debate, including Charles Hoskinson. As we know, I recently did a video about his um, opinion on this, his opinion on the XRP community, what he called us, what he said, and I will link that up here in the top right hand corner. Leading cryptocurrency media outlet Coindesk recently referred to the allegations seeking to ensure Ethereum is classed as a security as a C theory. Uh, you guys can read the word there. The Coindesk report infuriated XRP enthusiasts who called out the news outlet for siding with Ethereum. And John Deaton, founder of Crypto Law, a media outlet focused on cryptocurrency regulatory and legal news, was among those who reacted to the report. Deaton asked Coindesk to bring its top journalist to a debate if the media outlet is confident that he made this type of claim. If anyone at Coindesk is suggesting that I spew these types of theories, I volunteer to be crushed in a debate or civil discussion by one of their top-notch journalists. So, John Deaton coming out. He's got the gloves on. Let's ring that bell. Ready to fight. All joking aside, though, John Deaton has done a lot of research. Uh, when it comes to this uh, situation that we're in, in this whole story revolving around the SEC, the connections to Ethereum big banks, um, and, you know, I'm, I, I've reported on it on this channel quite a bit, but these guys, they have the information. They have the ammo. They have the proof. And, um, you know, for, for those to still think it is fake news or a C theory or whatever you want to call it, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. It's kind of laughable at this point in the game. I mean, you know, just even take any kind of C theory about anything that has come up in the last, well, let's say two and a half years. I think there are a lot of provable points now that suggest otherwise to um, so many things that have happened in the world in the last two years. Anyway. Don't want to get into that too much, but uh, I'm happy John Deaton is here coming out saying, hey, look, Coindesk, if you really want to talk about this, we can. And basically, I'm going to blow you out of the water with the research that I and the XRP community have found. So uh, interesting to see how this transpires. Wanted to thank Michael for posting that. Digital Perspectives here also reiterating, I repeat, only reason ETHgate won't go away is because the facts are not in dispute. Crypto Law US, which is John Deaton, Library is available to all. I'm glad to host a civil forum with Charles Hoskinson or anyone willing to sit down with John Deaton. If this was happening to ADA or Ethereum, I would feel the same. Considering this is what Charles Hoskinson said the other day, I was kind of a little disappointed with David Schwartz and others saying a lot could be said. This one from Michael Branch, reported here by thecryptobasic.com. Uh, apparently he had a sit down interview with uh, BitBoy Crypto. Uh, and Hoskinson said, despite backing Ripple to win the lawsuit, he was surprised to see the XRP community bash him because he described the allegation between some SEC staff and Ethereum as a grand C theory in his interview with Thinking Crypto. Of the many XRP holders who slammed Hoskinson over the comment, the Cardano boss singled out David Schwartz specifically. And you know what he said to Schwartz? I have the clip right here, okay? Stefan Hubert provided this clip. Oh, he even said it on video. Yeah, I kind of was a little disappointed with David Schwartz and others saying a lot could be said. And, uh, well, I'm just going to say it makes me sad. How about you grow a pair of balls and tell your community not to be conspiratorial? Maybe you should do that. 
Whoa, them's fighting words. Stefan Hubert uh, tweeting out a longer clip of the same uh, conversation. Now, here's some context. If you listen to him, it becomes quite clear he doesn't actually deny that there was no corruption. He essentially argues that it wouldn't do any good to accuse them because they all go to the same parties together, for example, and have to live together despite the corruption. So an interesting observation here, if you listen to this longer clip of the same uh, conversation, I see what Stefan is saying. On the thing that's going to win and focus on building bridges and relationships. Because of those comments, thousands and thousands and thousands of tweets. It was trending on Twitter, grand conspiracy. People attacked me, called me a petulant child, unprofessional. You know, and just all these just vitriol and negativeness. I kind of was a little disappointed with David Schwartz and others saying a lot could be said and... Uh, well, I'm just going to say it makes me sad. How about you grow a f***ing pair of balls and tell your community not to be conspiratorial? Maybe you should do that. Because at the end of the day, we all have to live in this space together. And hedging in the face of this madness doesn't solve anything. You very clearly have to say, we're here to win, yeah. and we're looking for allies to help us win because we're all in this together. Not, we're here to win, oh, by the way, the second largest cryptocurrency bribes people and conducts criminal conspiracies with government agencies. What are you doing, man? We, even if you win, you still have to kind of live in this industry. We still go to the same parties. We still do the same things. <laughs> It's just nuts. It's absolutely nuts. And that's why I said there's nothing further to gain from engaging with it. Because I respect you. I'll answer the question. And maybe, just maybe, somebody listening to this on the XRP side, if you let your blind rage and passion and anger assume for just a moment, understand that we're not exactly the enemies here. We didn't start this. We had nothing to do with this. Every statement that's ever been uttered is, you're not a security, let's fight together for it. I've been going to Washington trying... So you had to listen very closely. It was kind of buried in there. Uh, I will leave this clip in the description of the video if you guys are interested in listening to it again. But essentially, Charles Hoskinson says just that. You know, there's, there's, there's no benefit to call people out is basically what he's saying. Even if the corruption does exist, there's no real benefit to call us out on it because we all have to go to the same parties and, you know, we all have to live together in the same ecosystem. So, yeah, let's just keep a blind eye to it. Let's just all, you know, get along. Let's not call it out. There's no benefit to that. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, obviously. So an astute observation here by Stefan Hubert um, with regards to Charles Hoskinson and what he did say to David Schwartz. Now, speaking of David Schwartz, I happen upon this tweet thread going back to the Satoshi argument and, uh, they get into semantics here. There's nothing defamatory about saying that Craig Wright is not Satoshi, just that there is nothing defamatory about saying that I am not Satoshi. There is nothing inherently wrong with not being Satoshi, and they get into this argument here. I'll link it in the description. It really wasn't the point of what I wanted to mention next. Let me set this up with this. Okay, this is a video I did about three months ago. I'm not going to play you guys the video, um, but I'll link it up here in the top right-hand corner if you're interested. Basically, in this video, we were exploring the possibilities of four Satoshis, four people that made up Satoshi Nakamoto, and at no point did anybody come out and admit they were Satoshi Nakamoto, but I was questioning who it could have been. Um, we got down to Jed McCaleb, David Schwartz, Arthur Brito, still wondering who the fourth one was, and a lot of different reasons to support that. Um, and then down here, David Schwartz responds to a question by XRP Crypto Wolf. David Schwartz, is Satoshi confirmed, JK, LOL? Wouldn't be surprised if Satoshi is really the CIA or NSA. Now remember, David Schwartz did have a contract with the NSA back in the late 80s, early 90s, and I even talked about that briefly in a video I did yesterday, which I will link up here in the top right-hand corner for you. But David Schwartz responds here, that's not a terrible theory. If the NSA or the CIA happened to stumble on how to make Bitcoin, it might make sense that they would implement and deploy it to eliminate the risk that someone hostile to the US would do it first and potentially made billions of dollars. Now that to me sounds like David Schwartz has been thinking about this a lot. Either that, or he knows something that we don't know that he's putting out there as a possible theory. And I would think it was just a theory, but he did once work for the NSA. He did have a contract with them. And at the same time, he came up with the patent 
for distributed ledger technology starting in 1988. The patent was finally published in 1991. So in and around that same time he was working for the NSA, they had the technology for exchanging value via a cryptocurrency way back in the early 90s. Yet Bitcoin was not implemented basically until markets crashed during the financial crisis of uh, 2008, 2009. So to me, this is sounding a lot like David Schwartz suggesting that it certainly was a government plan. Real Boy XRP here just retweeting out a David Schwartz tweet, also stating that it is very unlikely to be one person. It would be quite unusual for the one person to have an entire skill set displayed by Satoshi. So also just kind of backing up this idea that Satoshi is likely four different people. Again, guys, if you haven't seen this video, I suggest you watch it. He says three or four people would be my best guess. Hmm, David, are you sure it's just a guess? Or do you know something we don't know? Tell me down in the comments what you guys think. And please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.